And I had a prophetic dream at that point, which, and I won't tell you the details of that, but it, it outlined a, th a third path to me that, that I had already picked up to some degree from reading Jung and also Eric Neumann, who is one of Jung's great students. This is Jordan Peterson stumping for the third path, or in German, Der Dritte Weg, a neo-Nazi organization founded in Heidelberg in 2013. For anyone thinking, that can't be what he's referring to, you're taking him out of context, I ask you, what's the context? Please cite or summarize the surrounding text I'm supposedly manipulating or omitting. Go on then, take your time. That's what I thought. Kindly allow me to provide some context. Peterson's advocacy for the Third Path is embedded within a discussion about Nazism that includes praise for Hitler. It's possible that he has in mind another Third Path, but given the context I just outlined, along with the hundreds of pro-Nazi remarks Peterson has made since at least 1996, along with his claim that all his work is predicated on atrocities like the Holocaust, I doubt it. Regarding the psychoanalysts Carl Jung and Eric Neumann, they struck up a friendship in the shadow of the newly minted Third Reich. As for Jung's connections to National Socialism, I've spoken about them in other videos and have written about them extensively in my book, The Devil and His Do, How Jordan Peterson Plagiarizes Adolf Hitler. Concerning Neumann's connections to Nazi Germany, he was born in Germany, lived in Berlin, and was working toward his medical degree when Hitler seized power. Being Jewish, he was forbidden from completing his practicum year, and thus his program. He fled with his wife to Tel Aviv, where he practiced Jungian psychology, wrote books marked by religious mysticism, and kept in touch with Jung until he, Neumann, died in 1960. One of Neumann's letters to Jung outlined a dream he had wherein he was an old pilgrim being hunted by Nazis. Jung replied by saying he believed Hitler was like Wotan, or Odin, a theory he turned into a compelling essay called Wotan, which he published in 1936, and which Peterson recently alluded to on the far-right Daily Wire while ruminating on the Book of Exodus. Jung believed that part of what drove the Nazi spirit forward was the re-sacralization of the political. You know, so Germany had collapsed into a godless materialist atheism in some real sense, and so that brought forth a deep longing for the archetypal gods, and Hitler provided that. They've rekindled the ancient gods, and Jung thought it was Odin on the warpath again in some fundamental sense. That Peterson spoke about Hitler at length, while once again doling out praise, during a conversation about the Book of Exodus, is significant, because the first Nazi propaganda pamphlet, called Bolshevism from Moses to Lenin, featured a conversation between Adolf Hitler and his occultist mentor, Dietrich Eckhart, about the Book of Exodus, which they used to demonize the Jews. Like the Jews had flooded Egypt and bamboozled the pharaoh, they argued, so too had they invaded Germany and hoodwinked Kaiser Wilhelm II. But getting back to Eric Neumann, like Jordan Peterson, he believed that a major driver of the Holocaust was religion. Neumann posited that Judeo-Christian ethics had given rise to Hitler's genocide because they repressed evil, and that this repression had caused evil to erupt into years of government-sanctioned mass murder. Neumann believed that Christianity's inability to acknowledge evil within ourselves had helped dislodge, to quote Roger Waters, the rusty wire that holds the cork that keeps the anger in. Moving on, the reason Peterson mentions Jung and Neumann is because he's about to talk about Nazism overtly. When he mentioned Jung and Neumann, he was talking about Nazism covertly. He associates Jung and Neumann with Nazism but then he associates many of the historical figures he's fond of with Nazism, hence why he mentions them in connection with Nazism. It's part of an unmistakable pattern, one I explain in my book. In the next clip, Peterson will discuss the embodiment of the hero who's courageous and navigates the third path between nihilism, by which he means liberalism, and authoritarian certainty, by which he means fascism or neo-Nazism. And this is one of Peterson's great contributions to the social sciences. In the past, there were only two options in life. Either you became a nihilist or a Nazi. Everyone knows that. But Peterson ingeniously suggests taking the third path, which just happens to be the name of a German neo-Nazi organization that was gaining momentum around the time he made this speech. By adhering to Der Dritte Weg, 
Peterson says, you can become a hero as well as a courageous individual, which is a variation on what Hitler told his dupes. Don't join the collectivist, Marxist, Jew-ridden left. Sign up with me and become heroic individuals. Together we can struggle forward. And that was, that had to do with the embodiment of the idea of the hero and the individual as the, like the pathway of the courageous individual as the mediating force between the chaos of nihilism and the totalitarian, uh, totalitarianism of authorita author authoritarian certainty. What a coincidence. While Peterson was stammering about totalitarian certainty, or neo-Nazism, he approximated a Nazi salute. This is what German neo-Nazis do, give stiff-armed waves to the crowd and pointed trees in approximation of the Zig Heil, because by law, gesturing with the genuine article is prohibited. Again, this is not a coincidence. Peterson is a crypto-fascist. Accordingly, Peterson's embodied hero or courageous individual who embarks on the third path is a clandestine reference to Hitler. And what he means is, you ought to be like Hitler. Allow me to explain. We can surmise that Peterson's hero is Hitler because Peterson once described Hitler as the emergent hero after talking about the heroic path. The, the, the heroic path is, is laid out in, like a, in, as a meta path by religious systems, basically, as the road to redemption. And Hitler, who spoke repetitively of Germany's path, Nazism's path, and the path of the white race, as well as achieving redemption for the injustice of Germany's humiliation at the Paris Peace Conference, said, For us, there is only one path which leads straight ahead, and it is from our movement that redemption will come. So, on the right, you see Hitler there, who's taking over from Hindenburg. I believe it's right. I can't remember. He was the president before Hitler came, came aboard. And so you see that there's the transfer of power from the wise old man to the, to the emergent hero. That's the image on the left. Hindenburg is the wise old man, and Hitler, who came aboard, is the emergent hero. Peterson has also raved about a propaganda portrait of Hitler dressed as a knight in shining armor and noted how he won a medal for heroism. Well, that's all propaganda for Hitler. And look at the imagery, you know. He's a knight, that's on the right. He's the, he's the knight of nationalism. Well, that's God the Father too, you know. You know, and the Germans had plenty of reason to be resentful and, and hateful because, I mean, think about what they went through. We can't even imagine it. The, first of all, there was World War I, and so there was many men, like Hitler himself, who served in the trenches. And there's one story about Hitler. He, um, he won a medal for heroism in World War I. With his medal for heroism, I think we can safely say that for Peterson, Hitler took the heroic path. Of course, you could say Hitler won a medal for heroism and not be a Nazi, but Peterson said it because he's a Nazi. It was just one compliment in a string of compliments within a wider pattern of hundreds of compliments, just in case anyone needs more context. Anyway, regarding your taking the third path and becoming the embodied hero so you don't become a nihilist or Nazi, Peterson is always telling his followers to become exploratory heroes. He has also said, But the Nazis went at it with something that wasn't really in the realm of idea. It was more in the realm of like embodied disgust and image. And so it was also very much more difficult to fight against from the ideational perspective. You know, it wasn't a well-developed intellectual movement. It was an embodied movement. And Hitler was extraordinarily good at using the metaphors and the images and then his incredible capacity for for propagandistic display to fire people up at a level of analysis that they weren't really even aware of. If you really want to become the embodied hero, perhaps you could take inspiration from the hero of the embodied movement that was National Socialism, the man who won a medal for heroism and embodied the Germans' desire for order and revenge fully. Well, Hitler came to embody the desire of the German people for order and revenge, and he, he embodied that fully. In a collection of Hitler's speeches I own, he uses the word embody 12 times. For example, the party must embody the optimism we National Socialists know so well. Concerning Peterson's appeal to become a courageous individual, the word courageous, or derivatives thereof, along with the word individual, were among Hitler's favorites. In fact, he referred to his followers as individuals. And here he is using the word courageous in association with following the Nazi path. 
What remains to be accomplished will be, if the advocates of our great ideal are courageous and reliable and unerringly follow the path laid before them. But Peterson has never called Hitler courageous, right? I think the reason that people like Hitler are attractive from the charismatic perspective, and this also goes for gangster figures, for example, in American movies, of whom there's an absolute plethora, is that people do tend to admire people do tend to admire those individuals who they see as courageous enough, so to speak, to act on their darker impulses. People admire Hitler because he was courageous enough to act on his darker impulses, like, say, having political rivals strung up with piano wire. And Peterson has urged his listeners to admire Hitler. Right, you know, one of the things I've always thought about Hitler is that, you know, people, you have to admire Hitler, that's the thing, because he was an organizational genius. He just said he's always thought we should admire Hitler. Always. But he couldn't be a neo-Nazi, hence why he told Joe Rogan that he could see Nazi as an aspect of his personality. As I just illustrated, the language Peterson employs when describing Hitler is practically identical to the language he uses when encouraging his adherents to become a certain type of person. You see, understanding Jordan Peterson has nothing to do with regurgitating heard words like, you're taking him out of context, nor does it have much to do with laughing at his sob sessions or addiction to benzodiazepines. However, it does have to do with analyzing and interpreting his spoken text, along with critically evaluating the context. As social linguists note, all meaning is contextual. And speaking of language, Peterson has concocted his own, an esoteric and fascistic cipher that I've largely managed to decipher. It was fairly easy, and only took about two years. Mind, I did go through a lot of notebooks. I provide explanations of what he says in The Devil and His Due. Learning the basics of Peterson's code is relatively simple. You don't have to be Alan Turing. But let's get back on the third path, which will lead us to the Third Reich. Authorita author authoritarian certainty that there was a third path. And then I started to understand its relationship to religious thinking, mostly to Christianity, but partly because that's my tradition, you know, in, insofar as I'm a Western person, say. And I understood as well that it had something to do, and that this was what was dramatized in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Passion story in the New Testament, was that it had something to do with taking responsibility for malevolence, because Christ is archetypally the person who takes the world's sins upon himself. And what that means in some sense is that if you read about history, you read about Nazi Germany, you read about the Soviet gulags. In between mentions of the Third Reich and Nazi Germany, there appeared a reference to Christ, probably because Hitler compared himself to Christ. As historian Thomas Weber notes in Becoming Hitler, in a bit of written propaganda commissioned by Hitler, the hired writer histrionically compared Hitler to Christ on the cross, who was miraculously resurrected. As Weber says, Hitler compared both himself and his party to Jesus, or described Jesus as his role model. After Hindenburg died and Hitler became the Fuhrer, the Nazis continued to portray him as the Messiah. Joseph Goebbels said that he was the intermediary between the people and the throne of God, and a song sung by schoolchildren went, Adolf Hitler is our savior, our hero. He is the noblest being in the whole wide world. For Hitler we live, for Hitler we die. Our Hitler is our Lord, who rules a brave new world. Nazism was like a religion. Indeed, Hitler referred to his movement as a new faith, which is probably why Peterson called him the Knight of the Faith. When Peterson talks about Christ taking the world's sins onto himself, which he does in discussions about Nazism, this is likely another allusion to Hitler. What he means is, Hitler gave his soldiers permission to commit sins, therefore they needn't have let their conscience bother them. The responsibility would be taken by the nation's savior. In Twelve Rules for Life, Peterson includes a lengthy quote from Mein Kampf, says the authoritarian alleviates his charges of all responsibility, and writes, Understanding my own capacity to act like a Nazi camp guard or torturer of children in a dungeon, I grasped what it meant to take the sins of the world onto oneself. Here we see Peterson again connecting Christianity to Nazism while identifying as a psychopath or to millions of stupid, confused, embittered, and disturbed men a savior who has thrown them a lifeline. 
But let's return to Peterson, who holds zero degrees in history, anxiously telling us how to read history. If you read about history, you read about Nazi Germany, you read about the Soviet gulags, you don't read as an observer looking at what other people have done. You read as the subject and the object of the history. You're both the person who was persecuted and the victimizer at the same time. And you, you have to see both of those inside you as actual forces in order to understand history properly. And of course, that's a very, very terrifying thing to do. It's easier to take the part of victim in some sense, even though that's terrible, right? Because who wants to be the victim of a concentration camp? Obviously, but maybe that's preferable ethically to being the perpetrator. Did you catch it? Maybe identifying with the victim is preferable to identifying with the perpetrator. Maybe. Peterson takes a standard historical teaching practice and contaminates it. His aim is not to have you consider what you would have done had you been a Nazi soldier, but to make you understand that at heart, you are a Nazi soldier. His aim cannot be to encourage you to empathize with the Jews, because he never asks listeners to empathize with the Jews. On the contrary, he hardly mentions the Jews. Rather odd for someone who claims that all his work is predicated on atrocities like the Holocaust. When he does mention the Jews, he either glosses over their ghastly fate, or insists that his adherents wouldn't have been Oscar Schindler or helped Anne Frank, an appalling notion they seem to find profound. Watch as he tells a fawning audience how he counseled a delusional patient by encouraging her to read Christopher Browning's Ordinary Men, a stomach-churning chronicle about a Nazi death squad perversely called the Order Police. Read this book, but don't bloody well compartmentalize it. Enough of that. It's like, read it like you're one of the damn policemen, which is how you should read history. Right? You read about Nazi Germany and you think, well, I'm Oscar Schindler. I'd save the Jews. It's like, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> right? You wouldn't, because people didn't. And the probability is very high that you wouldn't. And all you have to do is think it through. You know, Anne Frank. It's like, you're really going to put your family at risk to hide a group of another family in your attic for like multiple years while there's Nazis parading the street and where if you get exposed, you all die. You're going to do that, are you? It's like very unlikely. And, and, and no wonder, it's not surprising that it's unlikely, but you don't want to be inflating yourself with self, you know, with, with fictional heroism without actually knowing the facts on the ground. So I told her to read, read it and to understand that the policemen were her. And, and that's the thing to understand. Well, the idea that the savior is the person who takes the world's sins upon himself is exactly that. It's exactly the same idea. It's like, the way that there stops being Nazis is for you to know that the Nazis were you and for you to decide not to do that again. But you have to know, you see, this is the thing that people won't do. You have to understand that you could not only do what the Nazi camp guards did in Auschwitz, but that you could actually enjoy it. And then you have to decide that you're not going to do that anymore. And that's not an easy thing to figure out. Well, and that's what that chapter is about. So that's a rough chapter, man. That's a rough chapter. And that's only a bit of what it's about. You know, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot in there. And, and that's... Anyways, that's what that's about. Um, chapter 10. Chapter 9. He just admitted that Rule 7 in 12 Rules for Life is about realizing that the Nazis were you. Never mind that the chapter hardly mentions Nazis. Yet when I say that 12 Rules is overflowing with semi-clandestine pro-Nazi illusions, people call me crazy. It would never occur to them that I might be describing someone who's crazy. In any event, Peterson informed us we could enjoy persecuting Jews at a Nazi concentration camp in an apparent state of agitation. And that's because he's a wound-up plaything of schizophrenia, with which he was diagnosed while in hospital in Toronto in 2020, just before going off to Russia and Serbia to get off benzodiazepines. Among other drugs, benzodiazepines are used to treat schizophrenia. During Peterson's treatment, he suffered from akathisia, an excruciating condition where people are unable to remain still. Akathisia is often caused by the antipsychotics used to treat schizophrenia. What I'm saying is, Jordan Peterson is a psychologically shattered puppet who is at once the puppeteer, 
He is mentally unwell and appeals to the mentally unwell, along with people who are so primitive they identify as lobsters. Peterson imitates Hitler's speech, register, gestures, and dress, yet he's a resounding success, as was his spiritual master. Meanwhile, his detractors titter and tee about the impenetrability of his psychobabble, revealing they don't understand what he's saying, that they're unaware of his code, while the press labels him controversial, suggesting they know something is wrong, but refuse to comment. I should add that the idea of encouraging students to approach the subject of the Holocaust by imagining themselves as the victims, victimizers, and bystanders originated with the Frankfurt School, which Peterson casts aspersions on, almost certainly because nearly all the school's core members were Jewish. But let's continue with Peterson emphasizing to his listeners that they are the Nazis. But when you're reading about Auschwitz, you're not reading about past history, you're reading about exactly what people are like. And that's a very terrifying thing. And so one of the things you have to do if you're going to take responsibility for the nature of your being is to take responsibility for the malevolence that's truly part of human nature. Concerning taking responsibility for the nature of your being, he means being capitalized. He has admitted that his conceptualization of being capitalized comes from Martin Heidegger, who was a professor of philosophy and a dedicated lifelong Nazi. Whereas Peterson used to tell his students at the University of Toronto that they were Nazis and give them the Nazi salute to reinforce that when Hitler gave the Nazi salute, he was motivated by willpower, Heidegger encouraged his students at the University of Freiburg to join the Nazi party and gave them the Nazi salute. To a friend, Heidegger wrote, It would appear that Germany is finally awakening, understanding and seizing its destiny. I hope that you will read Hitler's book. This man has a remarkable and sure political instinct, and he had it even while all of us were still in a haze. The National Socialist Movement will soon gain a wholly different force. It is not about merely party politics. It's about the redemption or fall of Europe and Western civilization. And these days, which public intellectual likes to hold himself out as the champion of Western civilization? The fundamental assumptions of Western civilization are valid. How about that? You know, it's not... In the next clip, Peterson will explain how our sublimated desire to work as an Auschwitz guard has to do with the Jungian shadow, which has roots that reach all the way to hell. And that's, that's part of the encounter with the shadow from the Jungian perspective. And, you know, one of Jung's proposition was that the human shadow reaches all the way down to hell. And, you know, we're used to thinking of religious language maybe even as outdated superstition, but if you take that sort of statement seriously from a psychological perspective, what it means in some sense is that the malevolence that resides inside you, at least in potential, is of the same sort as the malevolence that produces the worst things that human beings have ever done. In other words, like the Nazis who worked at Auschwitz-Birkenau, you're satanic. Peterson has said that the Arbeit macht frei sign was satanic and poetic. He has also said that poetry ought to be written about Auschwitz. At the outside chance I need to clarify, he meant as an ode to the glorious extermination of 1.1 million Jews. He was referring to the elimination of chaos, a word Hitler used to describe the Jews, and the restoration of order, a word Peterson has used to mean Nazi order. Peterson has recurrently said that Hitler was satanic, and when he informed his audience members that their malevolence was akin to that which produced the worst things humans have ever done, this was a variation on his message that the Nazi is you. It's not a safe space, you know, in, in my classes, and I tell my students this right at the beginning. I'm trying to get them to understand why they are Nazis. Right, there isn't anything more unsafe than that. And all of them, virtually all of them, write back to me afterwards and say, uh, th this was the most worthwhile class I've ever had in my life, and it changed my life. It's like, well, I'm teaching you the worst possible thing about yourself. And your response is, oh, that was so useful, and I'm way better than I was. As for your realization that you could enjoy sending Jewish men, women, and children to the gas chambers, and how this satanic you intersects with the aforementioned Jungian shadow, Jung associated the shadow with the devil and Hitler. This is noteworthy because Peterson is forever going on about the devil and Hitler. 
the conscious, conscious-less mob called out the devil in Hitler. Circling back to the third path, here's Peterson linking the Holocaust and the talents of Hitler to taking a certain road. Also, watch as he approximates the Zig Heil. The more I read about the Gulag system in, in the USSR and what happened in China and what happened in Nazi Germany, the more it became evident to me that these weren't top-down systems imposed by tyrants on an unwilling, innocent population, but decisions on the part of entire cultures to go down a certain road. And Peterson is on the front lines of the culture wars, encouraging his conservative followers to go down a certain path. Often the leaders were following, which I would say was particularly the case with Hitler, which isn't to deny him his criminal culpability, but Hitler was unbelievably good at letting the crowd tell him what to say. You will have observed how Peterson's apparent criticism of Hitler about his criminal culpability was followed by praise. Hitler was unbelievably good at letting the crowd tell him what to say. For example, when he said, the Jew is pictured as the incarnation of Satan and the symbol of evil. This is one of Peterson's techniques. Add a pinch of facile criticism to a bowl full of praise. I'm not saying that Hitler was good. I'm saying he was bad. But he was good at nearly everything. Unbelievably good. Again, it's Peterson's psychotic disorder that compels him to gush about Hitler. By doing so, I believe he can temporarily alleviate his anxiety and achieve a sense of relief. Put another way, he can bring order to the psychological chaos caused by his schizophrenia. You know, he was a, he was a mirror for the crowd, and he was a good orator, but he paid attention to the crowd, and so when he said something that made everyone cheer, you know, their dark hearts would come out in the mob and cheer about something he said that was, say, dramatic or, or vengeful. Well, then he'd say more of that, and the things that he said that were peaceful, that produced no emotional reaction from the crowd, he just said less of. And so the crowd taught him over time exactly what to sell them. And that, that can be good in some sense. If a leader does that carefully, that, that means he's integrating what the crowd wants with his style of leadership. He went from talking about how Hitler successfully communed with fellow Nazis to discussing a leader who successfully feeds off a crowd while pointing to himself. Gosh, I wonder which leader he had in mind. After manically praising Hitler, he will criticize him again, thus leaving himself an out. However, after his criticism, he will come to Hitler's defense. But it can be terrible if the mob is the crowd and the mob is outraged and out for blood. And that's what happened in Nazi Germany. And so you can't blame it on Hitler. That's just not reasonable. It's distributed through the entire population. And it's at the individual level of analysis that's most significant. You can't blame it on Hitler. That's just not reasonable. It was at the individual level of analysis that was most significant. What he means is, the tail was wagging the dog. The war and the Holocaust happened mostly because of Hitler's followers, or who Hitler referred to as his individuals. Recall how earlier Peterson advised us to become courageous individuals and called Hitler courageous. I repeat, this is not happenstance. The language or code he has created is logical and consistent. As for saying you can't blame it on Hitler, note the euphemism. When members of the Frankfurt School returned to Germany from the United States after the war, they discovered that the Germans were reluctant to use the word Holocaust. Instead, they chose to refer to the eradication of two-thirds of Europe's Jews as it and what happened to the Jews. And Peterson is fond of employing the phrase what happened in Nazi Germany, while forever failing to unpack what did happen in Nazi Germany. He's more interested in giddily theorizing that Hitler was possessed by the devil, raving about the Fuhrer's mesmerizing abilities, or insisting to his followers that in terms of human behavior, the Nazis set the standard for normal. Jordan Peterson is insane. With that in mind, I want to show you one more clip of JP talking about the hero, who he foregrounds against a mystical version of Christianity or occultism. To explain why it's occultism would take time, and Peterson's interest in the occult is not this episode's topic. Consequently, I wish to draw your attention to Peterson saying that the hosts on the Tree of Life, which features heavily in the occult, represent a dying and resurrecting god as well as the body of the hero. The dying and resurrecting god and hero are Hitler, because Peterson has called Hitler a god, an evil god, god the father, as you heard earlier, and the emergent hero, 
as you also heard earlier. In addition, the body of the hero is a little like Peterson's embodied hero, who headed an embodied movement, that is, National Socialism. Listen to what he says about the hero and watch for semi-Nazi salutes. There's one thing that I want to tell you about Christianity that's relevant in this regard. So you'll, you can, you'll see this in the last quarter of, the, of Maps of Meaning when you read it, but there's, there's images that have popped up in the Middle Ages where the tree of, of the tree in the, in the Garden of Eden is there again. And on the one side of the tree there are skulls and those are being handed out by Eve. And on the other side there are these little things that are they're like fruits, but they're representatives of the hosts that are given to people when they undergo the mass in Christianity. And so those little hosts, which are made out of wheat, which is a dying and resurrecting God, are like the body of the hero. And so the idea behind the mass is that in order to overcome death, you're supposed to incorporate the body of the hero. And the body of the hero, the hero is the person in this mythological landscape who is willing to voluntarily confront death and will, as a consequence, be reborn. What he just said in his schizoid code was that Hitler will be resurrected or reborn. Given that Peterson once told his students, with the assistance of an elaborate chart, that he identified, above all, as an exploratory hero, which sounds a little like emergent hero, care to guess who the human form Hitler will take after being reborn and resurrected is? This is the juncture where Peterson's fans jump in with such delightfully articulate comments as, Bruh, you like literally think Dr. Peterson is Hitler. Bruh, get you head checked. Bruh. My argument couldn't be that Jordan Peterson is Hitler. That doesn't make any sense. Rather, it's that one of Peterson's schizophrenic delusions is that he's Hitler's son. Hence why he's always referring to Hitler as the father. For example, God the father, the great father, the benevolent father, and the jovial father of the race. In The Devil and His Due, I offer evidence in support of my claim that JP thinks he's the spiritual offspring of A.H. And I'll make a video called Hitler's Son, the Jordan Peterson story, to try to explain how Peterson does what he does because of daddy issues, and how the psychological abuse he suffered at the hands of his mentally ill father caused him to conflate his father with the leader of the fatherland. I know, I know, it sounds far-fetched, but it's a claim based on evidence. I understand that this video is on the internet, home to rubbishy ideas, misinformation, conspiracy theories, and fantastical claims, but please understand that I'm attempting to describe the beliefs of someone who's psychotic and deranged. Please do not make the elementary mistake of confusing me with the subject. If you'd like an in-depth analysis about Jordan Peterson and his badly concealed neo-Nazi identity, I recommend reading The Devil and His Due. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit like and subscribe.